Good afternoon. Welcome to our afternoon session. We have two cases. Um, one is a full grant and one is a motion on the application. Um, and Ms. Speaker, there is not a party endorsed on the other side, so I'm going to call both INRE MGR and INRE LMB. I understand you'll start with MGR, and then we'll give you a little time to transition to this, the, the issues that are different in LMB. That's OK with you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Lisa Speaker, and I represent the prospective adoptive parents, Mike and Susie Bischoff, in the MGR matter. Michigan faces a systemic problem of courts delaying adoption cases in favor of paternity actions, contrary to the plain language and explicit purpose of the adoption code, and also contrary to the United States Supreme Court authority. The adoption cases are being decided based on what happens in a paternity case and not based on the father's substantial and regular care or support or the best interest of the child. If an adoption case is always prioritized as the legislature intended, then the father's rights are determined by Section 39 of the Adoption Code based on his substantial and regular support and the best interest of the child. And then the application of the law is consistent and predictable. But not granting priority disrupts stability and permanence for the child and inserts uncertainty and unpredictability into the process. If this court allows the practice to continue of allowing paternity actions to take higher priority, it sends a message to trial courts around this state that you will never be reversed on appeal if you enter an order affiliation because the adoption code becomes a nullity. We ask this court to do three things. First, adoption case, first to hold that adoption cases should always take priority over paternity actions and that any paternity case should be stayed while the adoption case is pending and until it is resolved. Therefore, this court should also overrule in Ray MKK as it is an improper judicial construction that is contrary to the adoption code. Second, we ask that the court um, hold that an order affiliation entered while an adoption case is pending does not moot the adoption case, but instead that the paternity order must be vacated and only reinstated in the event that the adoption is denied under Section 39 of the Adoption Code. And third, we ask this court to reverse the lower court's decisions um, that held that the adoption appeal was moot and incorporate as its own decision the portion of um, Justice O'Brien's Judge O'Brien's dissenting opinion, which analyzed Section 39.2 of the Adoption Code and the father's lack of substantial regular support, and then also remand to the trial court for a hearing under Section 39.1 of the Adoption Code, which pertains to his fitness, ability to properly care for a child, and the best interest of the child. Before launching into the issues raised by this court, I think it will be helpful um, to give some overview to this court about what the choices are for two unwed parents who find themselves unexpectedly pregnant and who do not want to be in a relationship with each other. On one hand, the mother has several choices. One, she can make an adoption plan. And you should know that approximately 90% of all adoption, direct place and adoptions today are open adoptions where the biological parents do know the child as the child is growing. Mm. Second, she can spend the next 18 years engaging with this father who she did not want to have a relationship with um, and have potential disagreements with him over the next 18 years regarding custody, parenting time, school, domicile, all the types of issues that parents have with each other. She could surrender the baby to an emergency service provider under the Safe Delivery Act, and she can have an abortion, which doesn't require any consent or notice to the father. On the other hand, the, the biological father has options as well. He can provide support to the mother during her pregnancy and help her out. He can file a paternity action, which he can even do before the child is born by statute. He can join the mother in an acknowledgement of parentage, which would make him the legal father before the, at the time of birth. He can file a notice of intent to claim paternity uh, under the adoption code. It gives him a right to have notice of the adoption proceedings. And he can also participate in the adoption proceedings, either by consenting um, to the adoption or by objecting and coming in and going through a Section 39 hearing under first the first question being, has he provided substantial and regular support to the child? 
And even if he hasn't done anything to provide support to the child during the pregnancy or before the adoption hearing, there's still the hearing on whether he is fit, able to properly care for the child, and in that it's in the best interest of the child to award custody to him. Um, with those introductory comments, I will waive my fire-free zone. Moving to the purpose of the adoption code. The legislature made a concerted- Council, I, If I could ask a question. <clears throat> if, you, if your position is that we should overturn MKK, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, and by doing that, I guess, what is your concern about, you know, following MKK, you have to have good cause in order to move forward with the paternity hearing. Why is that, help me to understand why you have concern or problems with that. So um, the, the problem with MKK is that it creates a three-part test that's nowhere in the statute about what would um, be good cause under the adoption code. Okay. And so the MKK court said that uh, the man in that case having timely filed, and it was a very fact-specific case that was turning on the facts of that case, but it did create a standard that applies to everybody. Okay. That the father timely filed a paternity action, he's certain to be the father, and he's not merely attempting to thwart the adoption based on his actions of regular and substantial support. And so a couple of things to answer your question, Justice Bernstein. First of all, the Court of Appeals didn't have to go that route when it decided MKK, because the reality is the, the biological father in MKK had provided substantial and regular support. And frankly, he should have not been terminated under the adoption code because he satisfied section 39.2 of, uh, of the adoption code. And there was no reason to create this new standard of how to evaluate good cause. But another reason um, to answer your question, Justice Bernstein, is that what the court in MKK did was create a standard that allows a party to show good cause, but the good cause is directly contrary to the purpose of the adoption code mm -hmm. because it allows a paternity action to take priority over an adoption mm -hmm. case. And the legislature told us in section 25 of the adoption code that adoption cases have the highest priority on the court's docket. So you can't use as your ground for good cause something that's directly contrary to the intent of the adoption code. And I think that um, your question really leads me directly into um, the purpose of the adoption code and, and why it's so important to consider if we compare the purpose of adoption code and the purpose of the Paternity Act and compare them, um, I think it will really shed light on why MKK is not a workable solution. Ms. Speaker, can I interrupt you for just one minute? Um, it's, a, it's, it's, you make some compelling arguments about the, um, the statutory interpretation as well as the constitutional backdrop that uh, we have to consider it against, but it's, it's, it's a hard set of questions for us to think about in the absence of adversarial briefing. Um, and that's not your fault, and it's certainly not your client's fault. Are there other paths for relief without us having to answer the statutory interpretation and constitutional questions for your clients? For example, why isn't it, are, are, are you also arguing that in, the, in this particular case, the trial court's decisions to stay the adoption case um, were not consistent with the statute and MKK? and the court abused its discretion when it made that decision. You, 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 you have another path to relief, is that correct? The, yeah, I agree that one of our primary arguments is that the trial court um, erred by not following the statute under section 25 and importantly, the purposes of the adoption code under section 21A and also by not following MKK in, in the MGR case, in the, uh, and as we'll talk about we'll talk separately about LMB in LMB. Separately, yeah. 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 Um, so, but, but the problem, and, and really going back to Justice Bernstein's question about MKK, when MKK first came out, and so I've been doing adoption appeals for a good number of years, and we have a lot of adoption attorneys in the room today. Um, when MKK first came out, um, and I knew all the attorneys involved on both sides of that case, um, the adoption, uh, was overturned by the Court of Appeals because the, the trial court had said he was not going to adjourn the adoption case in favor of the paternity case, and that decision was over reversed. And we all looked at that adoption opinion and have studied it over and over again over the years. And, and our conclusion at the time, this was back in 2009, and going forward for many years after that, was that, well, really, the MKK standard, we can make it work because really the father in that case, if you look at the facts of that case, he had done a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, he had tried multiple times to send money to the mother. When she, ref when she sent it back, he sent money to the attorney for the mother. He took parenting time classes, including one where he wore a 
pretend baby for a period of time. He opened up a bank account to start saving money for the child. Yeah, that case but, is an example of why you would want MKK. I mean, and frankly, the statute itself says good cause. So why, you know, MKK might not be a, a difficult. And, and I think the, the Court of Appeals probably felt sympathetic for the, the biological father who had tried to do so much in that case. But like I said earlier, they could have just decided it on Section 39 too, mm -hmm. that he was well, quote unquote, a do something father because he had provided substantial regular support right. to the child. There was no reason to create this new standard. But in any event, when the adoption case came out in MKK, we we all believe that it did potentially create a race to the courthouse. Um, but it was countervailed by the fact that, you know, if the courts are going to look at all the facts, if they look at the facts that what this father did in MKK wasn't trying to thwart an adoption, he really showed that he intended to raise a child by his actions before the child was born. Um, but what happened after that was that a lot of the trial courts uh, weren't really following MKK. They don't cite it. Sometimes it's you know presented to them and they kind of ignore it. But that's um, not a reason to overturn MKK. That's a reason to appeal the trial court's abuse of discretion well, in following MKK, right? That's all I'm asking. Is well, no, I, I, I think at this point, and I'll, I'll have one more statement to make to answer your question, that it should be overruled because it is a judicial creation of a very strict code, the adoption code, and if the legislatures wanted to say that a paternity action would pr provide good cause to, to adjourn an adoption case, and the legislature could have done that. Uh, I came before this court in 2015 in a case called In Re ARS, and at the time I was arguing not that MKK should be overruled, but that, hey, it's not being applied consistently. And this court granted a MOA, and we had arguments in that case. And um, there was a whole long list of cases at that point, and this is 2015 and the list is longer now, of where courts are inconsistently applying MKK. And so it was creating a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability in the law. And part of that reason is because it's a judicially created standard that courts are going to apply in many different ways. And, it, and the result of that case was that this court ultimately denied leave. And I, I think I remember Justice, Chief Justice Young at the time, he's like, well, we don't really need to grant leave on a case just because it's not being applied consistently. And I think after that argument, I mean, what we really had to think about was, is MKK workable at all? I mean, if courts were to apply it, maybe, but why should the courts be allowed to create a standard that the legislature has not seen fit to create when it enacted the adoption code? And it's had many opportunities, which it's taken to update the adoption code. And nowhere you, has it are ever- Are you looking for a blanket rule that a paternity <laughs> action has to be stayed if an adoption case is initiated? Yes, Your Honor. Even if the paternity action is initiated first? Yes, Your Honor. As long as the, we, we ask in our briefing that the timing uh, is what is the father's status at the time the adoption case is filed? Has he become the legal father yet or not? Um, technically, because he, the adoption cases are not filed right the day the child is born. There's a time period that has to go by. There's all these rules in the adoption code. So I think the rule should be that once an adoption case is filed, if there's not a legal father on that day, um, then the adoption case should go forward because the adoption code protects all of the rights of the father. And that's been stated by this court in, in the baby boy of Barlow case many years ago. And consistent with the United States Supreme court, court authority, all of the father's rights are protected in the adoption code. And he has the right to show that he's provided substantial regular support. If he's done that, then the adoption case is over. And if he hasn't done anything, if he hasn't done a, a single thing, he can still show that he's fit, able to properly care for a child, and that it's in the best interest of the um, child to award custody to him. Ms. Speaker, what is the, I'm gonna ask you to try to think hard here for just a moment, but what is the real world impact if we primarily decide paternity issues on the basis of the standards set forth in the paternity code as opposed to the adoption code? In other words, with respect to those adoptions that are ongoing in this state in which the father's rights have been determined by the one law as opposed to the other law, what are the everyday practical consequences? From your perspective, I assume you'll suggest they're rather adverse consequences. What are those? Would you summarize this, those for me? Yes, Your Honor. Um, if we allow the paternity cases to go forward and be decided um, before the adoption cases, which 
remember that paternity cases can go so much faster than adoption cases. They can be filed while the child, before the child is born. Um, you only takes 14 days. It takes a few days to get your DNA testing and there's an objection period of 14 days and then boom, you can have a paternity order. Um, it's directly contrary to the permanency and stability for the child. Mm -hmm. Now, if a man has filed a paternity action before the child is born, then at birth, the potent prospective the adoption agency, the biological mother, and the prospective adoptive family know that this man is maybe going to be taking seriously um, his interest in the child. Um, so by not by allowing the paternity cases to go forward, we're directly contravening the purpose of the adoption code. If you look at 7121A, sub A, the, one of the primary purposes of the adoption code is to provide each adoptee in the state who needs adoption services to receive those services, to promote and safeguard the best interests of the child. But I'm trying to understand how, how are those interests of the child implicated by a paternity process in which we're largely focused upon DNA analysis as opposed to a paternity process that's primarily determined by the standards set forth in section 39, one and two. Okay, I, thank you, Your Honor, for clarifying the question. The Paternity Act has nothing to do with the best interest of the child. It is solely concerned about money. Um, and if you read the Paternity Act, which I have, <laughs> The purpose of it, as stated at the introductory section, is to compel support of children born out of wedlock. And the reason is so primarily so that the state doesn't have to pay for these children who are born out of wedlock. And in fact, 90% of, of paternity cases are filed by the state, and most of those are entered by default. So it's just to save the state money and to make sure that children are being financially supported. It has no reference to the best interest of the child. Whereas, of course, the adoption code is totally centered on the best interest of the child. The other thing um, that the Paternity Act doesn't do is it doesn't legitimize the child for all purposes. And I, I use that term because in the adoption code, under Section 39.5 of the adoption code, in the event that the trial court decline, that declines to terminate a father's rights, whether it's because he provided substantial and regular support or whether it's because it's not in the best interest of the children, child to terminate his rights, he could legitimize the father for all purposes under the adoption code if the mother is out of the picture. Um, but the Paternity Act doesn't use that language. There's two other acts that use language that talk about the child's rights, the Acknowledgement of Parentage Act and the Genetic Parentage Testing Act, both of which say that if you receive an order under those, either of those, that, or if you have an acknowledgement of parentage or have a genetic test order that establishes your paternity, the child is treated the same as a child who was born to a marriage. But the Paternity Act doesn't say anything about that. So I think to answer your question, and, and if I'm not answering your question, I hope you will let me know, um, the Paternity Act is really only focused about money, whereas the adoption code is about what's best for the child and stability permanency and expediency for the child. Because I'm just, I'm just trying to learn as much as I can um, because this is such a specialized area that you're, that you're working with. Why would somebody try to thwart? What, you, you, you'd mentioned that you know, sometimes paternity is used as a means to thwart the adoption. What motivation would that individual have to do that? The language about thwarting the adoption actually came from the MKK opinion. Right, no, um, I understand, but I just want to understand why would, why would someone do that? What would the motivation so, be? So uh, what I think, just this is more anecdotal, yeah, uh, although it might have fine. come up and it might have come into testimony in one of these cases. Um, a lot of times uh, uh, a man, oftentimes a young man, not necessarily, um, just wants, doesn't necessarily want to raise a child himself, but wants a family member to raise a child, wants a grandmother or an aunt or a sister. They just don't, they just think that the child should be raised by their own family. Um, but that is actually directly contrary to the adoption code, and that's why the adoption code requires that man to come into court and request custody. I He's see. not requesting custody f for his aunt I or his see. sister. He's requesting custody because he intends to raise this child. Um, and, and that's why, according to the United States Supreme Court authority, it's so important to look at 
not the DNA, not the biological connection, as the Supreme Court said in Lair versus Robinson. It's the relationships that the man has established with his child that are the most important thing to look at. Has he earned the right to be a father by actually being a father and not just by contributing genetic material to um, the child? And again, this is just, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, this is going to just be anecdotal, but I, again, this is just my way of trying to learn. Does the limbo that this situation creates create anxiety? I would just imagine, you know, if these are, you know, when, when you're raising children and they're young and you're uncertain as to what their future is going to be, what toll does that take on, not necessarily the child, because the child might not be necessarily aware, but how does that affect the people you represent? I mean, I think there's a lot of anxiety um, when, especially when in, in our cases where the children are both almost three years old at this point and have looked to their prospective adoptive parents as the only family they've ever known. Um, so you have to, to think about, you know, like, what is that child going to think if this placement's disrupted? But what does um, it mean to the parents? I'm just, I'm just trying to understand, like, how do, when you're representing your clients, how do they feel? Like, what is the, the how do they feel when it's with, without, with the sense of limbo? Oh, it, it, I'm, I'm assuming it, they make them very anxious and uh, unnerved um, just to have court proceedings going on. And so here's the thing, I think to really to answer your question, Justice Bernstein, about how, how people in the process feel, if, if a man takes actions early on during the pregnancy, either by supporting the mother, providing substantial regular support during the pregnancy, um, by filing a paternity action, by filing a notice of intent to claim paternity early on, then when the child is born, everybody, like even if the mom has decided to have an adoption plan and she knows the biological father is not on board with it, everybody knows at that point what the situation is. They know whether he has or has not provided substantial support or not. They know whether he is capable of raising a child and whether it's in the best interest of a child. Is this an upstanding person who just happened to get a woman pregnant that he barely knew, but maybe he would be okay raising a child? I know of adoption attorneys who have recommended that the adoptive prospective adoptive parents not pursue the adoption because once they learned about the background of the biological father, it didn't make sense to put the family through that. Um, and you can find all that out before the child is born. But if the father hasn't done anything, if he hasn't provided substantial and regular support, um, and, and you have the background information to know whether it's going to be in the best interest of the child to be with him or not, it kind of informs the whole process. And so when an adoptive family steps into the situation where they're taking a child into their home, um, they have a pretty good idea of the, of the chances. I mean, there's obviously no guarantee, as, as we've seen here, we've been waiting for a long time. Can I ask you a few questions, Ms. Speaker? The, 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 the uh, both children in both of these cases have been only with the adoptive parents. I, I think for LMB there might have been a four-day uh, window where that was not the case. Is that correct? They've yes, Your Honor. Um, and in this case, in MGR, the one single trial judge made all of the decisions that you're now that, that are now before us. The decision to stay the adoption case for the um, order of paternity, and then the subsequent uh, orders in, in that in both the paternity case and the adoption case. So, so we have all of those questions before us, whether she made those, whether the trial court made those decisions correctly, right? Y yes, Your Honor. Okay. And so in LMB, though, my understanding is the paternity case was before a different judge. Is that, that's correct? Yes, Your Honor. And you, you, uh, you appealed to the Court of Appeals, but they, I mean, I know they ended up granting a stay, um, but they, they did not retain jurisdiction. Where is the paternity case in LMB um, right now? Well, nothing's happened in the paternity case, to my knowledge. Um, it's since, sitting back in the trial court? Right. Since the Court of Appeals entered its order that reversed the, court, the trial court's decision to deny the stay because yeah. it was an abuse of discretion and granted the, the stay of the placement while the adoption appeal was pending. So then um, the Court of Appeals did not make any substantive ruling on the paternity order itself. They just reversed the, the question of the stay, it sounds like. Right. The, both orders were before the court, but the court chose not to address that. not to address the latter order. And, and my view is that it didn't feel like it needed to because once it said, hey, right. trial court, you should have granted I'm a stay, nothing would have gone beyond that. Okay. So if if, if this court believed that the trial court in the adoption proceeding, which I understand was a different trial judge, abused its discretion in 
um, applying the best interest factors. Um, and we don't have the paternity action before us. What would be the steps this court would take after okay. such a ruling? So just to clarify, we're talking about LMB now, yep. correct? Okay, good. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. <laughs> so um, there's a couple of options for this court if, if you know, first getting through the premise of the priority of the adoption code. In the LMB case, because you don't have the paternity case in front of you, because we prevailed on that in the Court of Appeals and no appeal was filed from that, um, and we have the adoption appeal pending. Wait, where I'm sorry, you prevailed on the paternity case in the Court of Appeals? I thought they only reversed the stay question, but not the paternity. Well, right, but the stay question would have stop the paternity case so there's no need to decide oh, anything so your else view is the until the adoption there case is, is over. No patern there is no final paternity order in LMB. Well, That's there it. hasn't been a final paternity order in either case, Your Honor, because neither judge, even though the judges ordered, um, entered orders of affiliation, neither of them entered support orders, and that's obviously a critical component of what has to be in a, a Paternity Act decision. That's the whole reason to have a Paternity Act decision is to have a support order. So until there is a support order, you can't have a final order appealable by right um, in gotcha. a paternity case. But So what does that mean? If this court believed that the trial court abused its discretion in the adoption case in, in LMB and uh, uh, ruled accordingly, what happens to the paternity case? Okay, in LMB, first, this, if this court ruled that the trial court in the adoption case Correct. abuses discretion in its facts findings on the best interest, right? Is that what Correct. you're asking? I'm okay. asking what happens. I think there's a couple of different outcomes that are possible. Um, technically, the issue, not technically, um, the, the issue that, issues that were raised in our appeal in LMB having to do with the merits of the case, and that is the preponderant, the burden of proof required in an adoption case under Section 39, and our factual challenge uh, that the trial court's fact findings about the best interest were against the great weight of the evidence, or basically its conclusion was an abuse of discretion. Um, yeah, I'm saying haven't assume, been decided. Assume all that happens. Right. What happens with the paternity action that's in front of another judge and apparently I think the them. paternity action would just have to be dismissed. Okay. That's what I'm asking. I mean, the order would potentially have to be, you would have to say that the order is vacated. But hypothetically- How can we vacate an order in a case that we don't have jurisdiction over? Um, I think a motion could be filed in the trial court after an opinion that outlines- So um, that's something you I mean, their hypothetically that could have been done already and I don't believe it has because of the order from the Court of Appeals in the paternity action case that said the trial court abuses discretion for not staying the case. I suppose what could have been done and can still be done is to file a motion before the trial court saying because of this order that said you abused your discretion, you should have stayed the case, you should have waited for the adoption appeal to be finished, you should vacate your order. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, but to, I think to get to the bottom part of your question, if you're asking about the adoption case as well, um, even though the Court of Appeals has never gotten to the merits of the case, of the LMB case, even though twice we've asked them to get to the merits, I've, I've, I've wondered, because in LMB, the trial court's decision, it's a very long decision on the best interest, and if you read that decision, all the facts are in there, and, and the judge's view of, of the father being able to muddle through and being stubborn and all the things he said about the father evading taxes and so on and so forth his conclusion was that it's not in the ch it's in the child's best interest to award custody to him hypothetically even though the court of appeals never weighed in on the best interest analysis the facts are all there accepting all the facts that the judge put in his opinion i, I think hypothetically this court could say that was an abuse of discretion to conclude that it was in the best interest of the child to award custody to him. Okay, thank you. Are there further questions? I just, I just want to understand again, I'm just trying to really learn this as best I can. So under your arguments, I guess the thing I'm trying to understand is, is, is that how do you balance, and I think you answered it, but I just want to kind of hear it just to make sure I understand it. How do you balance the thought, I mean, if you have the, you know, doing the paternity versus the adoption, how do you, balance the concern that some might have that if you start the adoption proceeding, it makes it very difficult for them to move forward if they can't go forward with their paternity issue. I mean, I guess that's my question is, is that can we, how would, how, what would the, the trajectory of this balance wind up becoming if we were to overturn MKK? So m I think my question is, you said it yeah, I prevent who from going for, you said. I'm asking it in such a convoluted way. I'm just trying to understand 
if we were to do this, would, the, would, would, would there be a balance then that would skew in such a way that the, let's say the, and that's all these different terms, I realize it, but let's say the birth father or birth mother gets shut out of the process. Okay, I think I think I can answer your question, yeah, Your Honor. Yeah, please. Just so to understand how this would be. Putting analysis. aside MKK, um, right. the way it would work if we have an adoption case filed and then a paternity case right. somewhere around the same time. Yes. The trial court who has the adoption case, and frankly, it should be the same trial court. I mean, obviously, we disagree with what happened in MGR about how the, right. that trial court handled the two cases in front of her. Right. Um, but really, it should be the same trial court. But that's not always something that we can control. Um, so the adoption case moves forward. The father is given notice. He has an opportunity to come in. Um, and his rights are fully protected okay. uh, under the adoption code. He comes in and requests, uh, he comes into the hearing, the section 39 hearing, once he's been identified, he's been, if he doesn't show up under section 37 of the adoption code, then the trial court can just terminate his rights then and there. But if he shows up to court, all he has to do is show up to court with an attorney or not, um, then the court begins the analysis. And often there's an adjournment, so I don't want you to feel like, yes, it's fast, but we the courts are always giving people time to go find an attorney or to appoint, they sometimes appoint guardian items. Um, sometimes there's scheduling conflicts and they wanna make sure everybody's able to, to, to be present at the hearing. Um, the court first goes through 710-39-2 and inquires into what, and there's evidence presented, it's an evidentiary hearing, about whether the father has provided substantial and regular support and care to the child. It also allows for established custodial relationship. And the reason I haven't been talking about the established custodial relationship is because in direct placement adoption cases, the child's placed usually at age one or two days, right after birth. And so there really isn't an opportunity for the father to have an established custodial relationship, but it's not outside the realm of possibility because I certainly have seen cases where the father's having visitation with the child while the adoption case is pending. Mm -hmm. um, there's also been cases where the child's older, it's not a direct placement adoption. Um, but for, for purposes of the cases before this court today, can he produce evidence that he's provided substantial and regular care and support? If he has, the adoption case is over. He cannot be terminated under the adoption code. He can only be terminated under the procedures for a step-parent adoption, which provide for two years of no support, no contact, or under the juvenile code, which again, two years of no support, no contact. So if he's done something during the pregnancy or the 90 days before the adoption petition, uh, the notice of hearing is served on him, he, the adoption will not go through because he's shown that he really intends to raise this child, that he's not just saying it, but he means it through his actions. But even if he hasn't done anything, at all. Section 39.1 of the Adoption Code is the next section that kicks in, and the trial court in the same hearing will look at the evidence that's been presented um, and determine whether the father is fit, whether he has the ability to properly care for the child, and whether it's in the best interest of the child to award custody to him. If it's not in the best interest to award custody to him, then his rights are terminated and he does have a right to appeal. Nothing can be finalized while the appeals are pending. And I've certainly been on appeals where the um, putative father has appealed and, and, and we're waiting for the Court of Appeals to make its decision. Um, but if it is in the best interest of the child to award custody to him, then again, his rights cannot be terminated under the adoption code. So it's really about who is this person and is he really in a position to raise this child for the next 18 years? Thank you, Counsel. Any further questions? Thank you very much. The cases will be submitted. Thank you.